This is the Shogun Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about the Shogun finale, Chapter 10, A Dream of a Dream. The hostages are free. He got just what he wanted. No dirty hands. No war. Just a woman. She can't have heard me. Before. Before she died. I spoke before. God, not your God. Oh, my God. Just God. Do you think it was acceptable? Rest assured she was already sanctified. Before her death, she came to me and received absolution. I think it would have pleased her to see us being civil. Welcome back, fellow warriors, to the Shogun Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We are on the finale of Shogun Chapter 10, A Dream of a Dream. I am one of your hosts, John. And I'm your other host, Derek. Welcome back, fellow warriors. Yeah. Yeah, the final time on Shogun. I know. Yeah, I think we can now on 100 million percent say there isn't going to be a second season of no, Shogun, can I we? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are other books yes. technically within the series mm-hmm. um, at different points in time as yeah. well, not as such immediately after. Yeah. Um, so unless there is something around those novels that mm. possibly there is an, uh, you know, an impetus towards um, sort of adapting really for tv yeah i don't know but ultimately this is a self-contained show yeah. of a, a single series and this is certainly the end of the story for john blackthorne for Tornaga, and for medical uh we were the three main characters of course yes. of, of the show as, as you know you've been watching the show you know that uh but that is the end of their story there isn't anything else in the further books that's connected to these three characters. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, interesting choice. I mean, this is very much an epilogue. It is. It yeah. is not really the big finale. Mm. This is an epilogue of rounding up uh, where people are yeah. after uh, the events of the previous chapter. It is, isn't it? And, and I was thinking about it, and I know we've made our Game of Thrones comparisons a few times throughout the series, and, you know, it's not comparable to Game of Thrones because Game of Thrones is an ongoing series went on for eight seasons but traditionally this is how Game of Thrones would end their seasons they would have a big battle moment or a massive moment in the second last episode and the last episode wraps things up and sets things up for the next season the big difference here with Shogun is there's nothing to set up for the next season here so it is wrapping up the stories of all of the characters and the impacts that the last episode chapter nine has on all of those characters yeah being a little bit coy just to make sure we are going to talk full spoilers on the finale of shogun in this in this podcast so make sure you go out and watch the episode before listening to the podcast uh, don't want to spoil anything before you do that so uh, when you've watched it come back and listen to the rest of the podcast absolutely and whilst you're away why don't you subscribe to the podcast mm-hmm. over at tvpodcastindustries.com where you can subscribe to any good or evil podcast player of your choice mm-hmm. you can also join us on facebook over on our group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash tv podcast industries and of course we are covering the end of the star wars the bad bat at the moment yeah uh, so you can join us there and we have just finished uh the second season of invincible as well yes, so we have we have a fair bit of content still flying around including this final podcast on shogun Absolutely. And this episode's called A Dream of a Dream. And interestingly, the next show that we're going to be covering is The Dead Boy Detective set in the world of the Sandman or Dream. 
uh, over on Netflix. So, uh, so that's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, so if you want to hear our thoughts on the Sandman show, we do have a Sandman podcast or Sandman feed. Uh, and obviously our shows always come out on the main feed on TV podcast industries. But The Dead Boy Detectives comes out on Netflix. All episodes coming out in one day. So uh, we're not going to cover the whole thing in one day. Um, we are hoping to put out a couple of, couple of podcasts to cover the full season. So uh, get watching that when it comes out on Netflix from next Thursday. Absolutely. And coming up on May the 4th, mm-hmm. be with you. It is Ted. Tales of the Empire, which we'll be covering yeah. as well. Yeah. So uh, there's some of our up and coming shows that we'll be covering mm-hmm. as well. But let us get into our spoiler filled discussion of Shogun Chapter 10 A Dream of a Dream. Mm-hmm. Derek, what are some of the episode details? Yes, for the final time, this show was, of course, based on James Clavell's 1975 novel Shogun. The head writers for the show are Rachel Kondo and Justin Marks. This episode was written by Megan Huang and Emily Yoshida. Uh, Megan is a staff writer on the series and wrote episode six, and Emily's the host of the official Shogun podcast and was one of the credited writers on episode four. Lovely stuff. Yeah, yeah. You definitely highly recommend checking out the um the Shogun podcast. It's, Absolutely, yeah. it's like a it's like an interview podcast with the cast. It's like a behind the scenes kind of documentary. It is really, yeah. and it, yeah. it's really good. It's really interesting. Yeah, they've got they've got um, pretty much everybody sure. from the costume designers uh, through to all the cast and, and directors of the episodes, giving their uh, thoughts on on the show. And sometimes, interestingly, again, they're they're obviously recorded ages ago, way before the show came out. So uh, sometimes they may kind of give you an inkling of things that are coming up. So there's some things that are on there on the episode nine podcast that actually happened in episode 10 so um but it's interesting to see you know how your perspective can change in an episode when you hear how the actor approached the the part uh that yeah. kind of thing so emily uh, did a great job hosting that podcast so definitely uh, yeah hoping yeah. to see more from her in the future uh the episode once again directed by frederick toy who we've talked about uh, multiple times we've spent we talked about him last week uh, as the also the director of episode nine and uh, director of of uh, fallout which is out at the moment on uh, on prime video where he directed i think three episodes of that Yes. So, yeah. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the synopsis for Shogun Chapter 10, A Dream of a Dream? Sure. In the wake of the tragic death of Mariko, John Blackthorne finally considers the true nature of Toranaga's plan. Yes, so a true epilogue, as we as we mentioned really earlier is, on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The episode opening with uh, John Blackthorne in the future um, and his grandkids running around. Yeah, uh, grandkids. Yeah, but running around his room, which looks like a museum to his time in Japan, um, and all of the items and all of the all of the things he picked up in his time there. So, uh, really like that. It's got kind of that that interesting one with the with the kids kind of going. Is this really? Is this really our grandfather? Did he really use a, a samurai sword at one yeah. point in his life? You know, um, and back in England as well, um, yeah, in a kind of you know twee Tudor kind of place. Interesting, yeah. But the kids do call out that the uh, sword uh, that he's that he used was effectively in the battle where he saved uh, Mariko because he, he says he took on uh, some shinobi who came into the yes. who came into the building. So uh, they just they just mentioned that. So I think that's quite interesting seeing him on his yeah. deathbed at the start of the episode because again it's almost like it's setting you up that you're not going to be expecting the death of John Blackthorne throughout this episode, right? It sets you up straight away. Here he is in his old age on his deathbed remembering back to this yeah, time yeah exactly yeah. it's all, almost kind of a fever dream because he doesn't mm. look particularly well no. for sure no. um i think as well you know it's an interesting choice to do an epilogue because i mm. think you know it, i think it can just divide opinion really yeah. i mean it wraps everyone's story up in a nice neat little bow which is mm-hmm. great but it also you know um I guess there are people that expect the the big play out mm-hmm. to happen, uh, but it really plays out in terms of conversation yes. and predictions. So you don't actually see it. So mm-hmm. it's a really interesting choice, and I reckon it could be um, a bit marmitey for for certain viewers for sure. Yeah, if you're not from the UK, marmitey means you either love it or hate it. Yes. Right? So. <laughs> <laughs> just in case, just in case you don't you don't know that. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great way to wrap it up and made it feel more like a novel uh, being brought to the screen, more like those epic uh, stories that we used to see on TV back in the 80s and, and, uh, and even from 70s TV shows where it is about wrapping up the storyline, not about giving action to yeah. an action-orientated audience. But I do expect there's going to be a lot of people watching ex- expecting that there is going to be this massive battle for a sack um I which think, is referenced in the episode yeah, as well yeah. but i mean i think it does benefit from the fact that it does reference actual history here yes, yes it's 
novelized mm-hmm. and it's the certain aspects obviously it's not following history it's not a historical book yes. but it has the benefit of the touch points that it is following the history mm. of that period yeah. uh, just with different names you know it's a novelization of history yeah. so i think you know in a sense that helps solidify the predictions being made yes. here yeah. uh, by some of the key characters uh, even though we don't fully see it play out yeah it feels like they're expecting you to Google it at the end of the episode. Just go and look up what happened in Japan in the 1600s, and you'll see what happened <laughs> to these to these characters. Um, because I would have expected like a placard at the end going, "And Lord Taranaga became shogun," or something like that, uh, or whatever happened to John Th- John Blackthorne, or you know, you'd expect I something must like say, that. I you know, was yeah. expecting that at the end as well. A bit of kind of smaller writing giving. Mm-hmm sort of the the history but we don't mm-hmm. get that yeah. and i i think you know again it's 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 a choice of the showrunners here exactly but let us get into our bushidos mm-hmm. uh, bushido number one uh we go to osaka to yeah. see the fallout of the death of mariko here yeah and um we, we actually pick it up with the immediate aftermath of Mariko's death. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think interestingly for me, you know, Yabashiga actually says, forgive me. Mm. And I think that's because we actually had a conversation uh, in between podcasts wondering, yeah. you know, were the Shinobi assassins the to kill Mariko mm. or simply to arrest her yeah. uh, or take her hostage or prisoner yeah. uh, really um, rather than killing her. So Yeah, it's one of the, it's one of those interesting ones. I talked about the official Shogun podcast. This was one thing that came out on the official podcast where they said Yabashiga never expected the death of Mariko. He, he expected that he was letting the shinobi in to kidnap her because the death of her would cause a massive incident. Um, she's a very important figure in Osaka. She's a very well-known figure, so he was expecting that she would get out uh, out of this alive, um, but she would be taken. Um, so his expression of regret here, his, his asking for forgiveness here, um, is the shock of what's happened to Mariko, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually thought we were going to see the breakdown a bit of Yabashigi. I don't think so. I think it's just the immediate after, after effects of the the weight of what's happened mm. here because we do see Ashido meeting Yabushigi uh-huh. um, saying your seat on the council is secured now. Yeah. Go back to Izu and await your command because we have the council of regents effectively being pushed by Ashido to um, declare war and to prepare for war. Yeah. But you do see uh, the regret um, of Yabushigi and I think you do, yeah, you see almost like shell shock. It's that that moment, exactly. direct after effect, you know, she does wondering if it's just that his his ears are still ringing from the explosion. But it's much more than that. It feels like Yabashiga is really highly affected of this. But as you say, it's following on from the council meeting. And I think the council meeting itself is probably the most interesting part of what's happening in Osaka, um, where we have each of the uh, each of the council of regents reacting to the death of uh, of Mariko, yeah. um, Kiyama saying everything here was tragic and completely avoidable. If we hadn't been pushed into this situation, this wouldn't have happened. Ono um, saying it shouldn't have happened and absolutely shouldn't have happened to Lady Mariko. Um, she deserves a Christian burial. And you see Ashido still standing firm in his beliefs that because he's under the banner of the um, of the heir to the throne, that therefore he is righteous in whatever he does and says Mariko doesn't deserve a burial because she's uh, part of the family, the last member of the family that killed Lady Ashiba's father. And you can see Lady Ashiba in the background recoiling from this almost, going, it's not, she doesn't deserve the punishment. She's my friend. She didn't do it. She wasn't involved. She deserves her Christian burial exactly as uh, as she should be getting. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's really interesting that the, the two points here is, I think, for me as well, is that, you know, Ashido is very much aware that this is also Toranaga trying to sow division. Mm. And you get that uh, forbearing of division, of splits, not just from the members of the council mm-hmm. uh, discussing Mariko's death, yep. but primarily Ashiba, who effectively contradicts Ashido um, about that she won't get a a kind of honourable burial, in a sense, 
to say that Marico should be given uh, honor in death exactly. and, and given the rightful burial that she deserves. Mm. And so, you know, that's an important little contradiction Absolutely. and undermining of Ashido here, which you can sense would filter through to or be noted by the other members of the council. Yeah. And, and it, Ashido's you know? also saying that the actual attack itself, the shinobi attack on the castle in Osaka, he's trying to say that that's Toranaga that, that did the attack yeah. and that potentially Mariko's death was accidental. But he was trying to sell the division by setting up the, the shinobi attack, not by him sending Mariko to, uh, to Ashiba, which I thought was a really interesting play. And it almost gets the Council of Regents on side. I think this is an interesting touch. And then we have another earthquake strikes yeah. Osaka. But it's and during it, the, the, the vote yeah. for for war, um, yeah. you know. But it, it stays their hand almost. It's like as if they're about to reach out to sign the declaration saying they're all aligned. And then they stop and go, maybe we need to consider this more. And we hear from Yabashiga's story. Yeah. This is exactly what happened with the former Tycho. He had a time where he was about to go to war. There was an earthquake. It stayed his hand. He had to make peace because nobody would align with him in the war. He took a little extra time to think about, I guess, yeah. uh, whether he was going to go to war or well, not. I, so I really like that this because uh, this is yeah. the other part of it is the superstition, yeah. you know, that the earthquake was seen as a bad omen. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, we have here the members of the council saying, well, maybe we need more discussion before we do the vote. And Ashido saying, you know, we're not peasants here digging in the dirt mm -hmm. and stop with this superstition. And, yes. you know, that because I think that really kind of comes from um, the background of Ashido in yeah. real life, who came from a peasantry exactly. and worked his way up to this position of yeah. power. It's that little glimpse into, you know, the gradual eroding of superstitions here. Mm. Um, Ashido, in a sense, being quite modern about it, this is superstition. Yeah. Uh, this does not bring a bad omen onto the decision mm. for war against Toranaga. And yet you have, as you say, Yabashige giving the story of yeah. the Taiko. But um, I, think, I think the interesting part of it, whether it's superstition or not, I think the interesting part of it is because the earthquake happened to the Tycho, it gave him extra opportunity to consider his, op his options and he chose peace instead of war because he had more time. He wasn't yeah. reactive. So no, absolutely. it's almost, almost saying this is the kind of thing that Toranaga does. If Toranaga was given extra time, he would always consider the path to peace, avoiding war. And because an earthquake happened during the Tycho's time when he was about to go to war, he considered peace then. Maybe this is an indicator that Ashido would decide to go peace or the other council of regions wouldn't sign off on the war. But I think yeah. Toranaga would be of the same mindset as Ashido. But what Toranaga would do is understand that members of the council would come at it from a point of it being a bad omen and calculate that mm -hmm. accordingly. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I find that it, it is that clash of maybe superstition with modernity here and, and yeah. how it's viewed, whether that is from um, folklore or even from the church, mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah. And I really enjoy that. I mean, there's a really interesting book called Slaying Dragons about mm -hmm. the exploration of the Alps, because a lot of the time... Um, People thought dragons lived at the top of the mountains. Right. And it, until those early explorers climbing the mountains to the peak and realizing mm -hmm. actually, well, there was nothing there. And then yeah. putting scientific instruments up there, mm -hmm. realizing that actually there is none of that there. Yeah. No kaiju on top of the Alps. Unfortunately. No, unfortunately yeah. not. So <laughs> I really like this, how it, how it all played out. But I think importantly, what is the forebearer to later events mm. is Ashiba undermining Ashido's view of how Mariko's body would be treated. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we talked about it, that off screen, there was this alliance between um, Ashiba and uh, and Ashido, that they would be married, their in, intent to marry. And it's just interesting to see it play out here on screen that Ashiba, the one that really has power because, of course, she's the mother of the uh, of the um, the heir, that she always has that power in the back of her pocket that she can either give support or take it yes, away exactly so i kind of kind that of like is that. her ace in her hand exactly effectively. exactly yeah. the last thing that happens in osaka is what happens with john blackthorne but let's deal with his story in its own 
Bushido. Yeah. Bushido number two is John Blackthorne's mm. epilogue here. Yeah. Um, first up, you know, we ha- we see the fallout of the cannon mm-hmm. being fired at the door and John Blackthorne picking up Mariko, mm. uh, yelling and so on, but ultimately seems to pass out or has injuries from that explosion, which the adrenaline at the time doesn't really make him feel them. So he passes out uh, and misses the funeral of Mariko. Yeah, but I suppose the big moment of him holding Mariko in his arms is that he says, he prays over her, he says, she is now yours, Lord, effectively. He says that uh, she is now committed to uh, to the Almighty Father. Yeah. Um, so he has passed out exactly as you said, John, and I just think it's kind of sad, given everything that they've gone through, that when he wakes up, he completely misses Malachi's funeral. Um, he The funeral has taken place. You know, we kind of see it in the, the panning shot of Osaka, where um, where we hear the Latin the Latin voices uh, of a, a Christian burial or a Christian funeral, um, and you think maybe you'll go into the funeral itself, but you don't. Yeah. We don't actually see the funeral. We're like John Blackthorne; we've we've missed it completely. And then he's allowed to be taken out of Osaka. Um, Father Martin is the one that that escorts him out of the city, and they have an interesting conversation, I suppose, about that moment with Mariko that John says. I wasn't shouting to my God. I wasn't shouting to your God, to Father Martin. I was shouting to God, and I hope he was able to hear me. I'm not sure if Mariko heard me before she passed, but I was committing her soul uh, to the heavens. Yeah, um, and, and, fa- and you know, I just think it's interesting from the Catholic faith and from the Christian yeah. faith because it's really important that what Father Martin says to him is, "Don't worry, she already had." done her last rites effectively before this happened to her so yeah. so from mariko's perspective even if let's say the lord didn't hear john's prayer she had already committed uh, to the lord before she died so yeah. uh, i think that's an interesting Absolutely. discussion Absolutely, and i think also you know even um on, on the way to Osaka Harbor, you know, J- John Blackthorne thinks that effectively he's going to be, you know, fake ambushed and killed, even though he's been told he's allowed yeah. to go free. Yeah. And it isn't until the forest is like, is this where I'm going to get killed? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we find out, um, that one of Mariko's requests when she was being given her rights mm-hmm. by Father Martin was that he is allowed to go free. And Father Martin keeps his word on. There's a really interesting moment where, you know, John Blackthorne is almost kind of ruminating, theorizing, um, you know, what if Catholic, Protestant and Calvinist he mm-hmm. brings in as well, you know, that actually there wasn't that strife between them because the interesting point is for the Europeans, the big... And this is what I find really interesting. You know, at that time, you could argue the Cold War of mm. the 16th and 17th century in Europe yeah. was between different religious mm-hmm. practices of Christianity, between Protestant and Catholicism. Absolutely. And their worldview, you know, the colonialization uh, of the Americas and other parts of the world by the Spanish, the Portuguese, the British, the Dutch were around effectively consolidating that power Mm -hmm. of christianity or protestantism effectively and so it's almost that play of saying what if we weren't enemies we weren't at Mm -hmm. war because of these the different faith yeah um and you know it, it echoes all geopolitical ideologies that are sort of at hammer heads with one another and i i like that because it is the same and it, it's a very modern aspect to yeah. bring into this and it's personalized with father martin mm-hmm. saying you know how mariko would have enjoyed us speaking in this way yeah. without animosity uh, yeah. almost as friends um, and he says yeah. you know he will keep his word that yeah. he gave to Mariko, even though, in a sense, he said the plan was to kill him. Yeah. Um, we've seen him go against the orders of his superior before by mm-hmm. traveling up to Edo. Yeah. And um, that maybe he's doing that again in some respects. Potentially, yeah. He is, he is committing to what Mariko had asked for. Um, but I do think it's interesting 
in the response to Father Martin when he's going, oh, we're, we're getting on really well, aren't we? Wouldn't this be great if we could do this all the time? And as you say, Blackthorn's going, well, that'll never happen. There's too many different factions of religion. We will all fight. Um, you know, even cults of age, it's not just where he says Calvinist, he says uh, Catholics. Um, Protestants, Calvinist, any other shittist, there will always yeah. be fighting in between them. We, we will never, we will never stop. And you know, it, obviously, prophetic for uh, for the next uh, four hundred years of battles between religions. You know, uh, where people believe they're right in their belief, and and nobody else is right, and will continue to pervade wars across the world uh, right up until present day. So, um, so it is an, a really interesting discussion. But also, as part of the discussion with with Father Martin, we get, I suppose. If you didn't realize that last week's episode, Chapter 9, Crimson Sky, was Taranaga's plan to wrest away power from Ashido, we hear a lot from Father Martin here in this discussion. Um, he says that all the prisoners have been freed from Osaka, that the stranglehold that Ashida had put on Osaka has been removed effectively. He believes that Taranaga is going to be dead in just a few weeks, but John effectively is saying to him, there's been no dirty hands, no war. It was just on one woman. We didn't have to exactly. go to a massive battle to end this stalemate or this deadlock between the two sides in this war. It was on Mariko, and she played her part, effect. Yeah, I mean, she is this crucible and mm -hmm. that Taranaga has used. And John Blackthorne says to Father Martin, you know, if you believe that, you don't know Yoshi Taranaga, giving him his full name. Mm -hmm. um, because I think John Blackthorne is realizing... Um, the aspects that Taranaga has brought here, the plan, or yeah. at least grains of it, and yeah. you know, I so just it, think that moment as John is leaving the harbor, going out to Yabashiga's ship to be transported back to, uh, back to the fishing village to to his own ship, um, that moment where he's in the boat and you can just see him completely breaking. Yeah. Um, after realizing or after finding out that Mariko is the one that effectively saved his life one final time, um and that she's gone. Uh, I just think that is so stunningly played, um, absolutely beautifully played by Cosmo Jarvis as the as the um, tears well in his eyes and he's yeah. trying to hold them back before, uh, yeah, I suppose, going back on to, to a ship with, uh, with Yabashiga, you know? Yeah. Interestingly, yeah. as the ship arrives back at, in Ajiro, we see that his boat, um, his, his galley has mm -hmm. been scuffled, um, but then there is this, all that, element to John Blackthorne's epilogue where he goes to meet Toranaga. Oh, I love this. Um, yeah. You know, what I kind of initially liked about this is that he meets with Omi again who asks him for his swords and pistols and this mm -hmm. time John Blackthorne hands them over yeah. to him yeah. uh, as he's brought to Toranaga for uh, this meeting. Yeah, and of course this time going without a translator um, but he's learnt I suppose what he wants to say he has a speech fully prepared for Toranaga to say to him. Uh, also, interestingly, uh, we fi we get the final reveal, I suppose, of the spy from the fishing village. Um, yeah, Miraji. Yeah, Miraji, yeah. who, who reveals now to John. We knew it from earlier on in the season, but reveals to John that he is a samurai who's been in place here feeding information. And it's, I suppose, it's a, with a little bit of sadness because effectively he could have been there to translate everything John said all the way from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, but it was on Mariko to do that. He reveals that he was told he must join the Catholic faith. He must learn the Portuguese ways and learn Portuguese. So he's able to speak to John pretty well yeah. and have an actual conversation with him. He apologizes almost immediately for that. Um, but his his higher job, I suppose, was working on behalf of Toranaga and passing the information to him that he needed. But John stands powerfully, I think, in front of Taranaga, trying to encourage him to stop his persecution of the people of the village here, that the people of Azura didn't do anything. They're not responsible for the, d the destruction of John's ship, um, and that Taranaga needs to stand down. And he's going to go so far here that John Blackthorn almost commits seppuku. Yeah. He, he's saying to Taranaga, I've always been your enemy. Don't blame the people of this village. I've always been here trying to use you for my purposes, but the people of the village here have done nothing. So if they, if one of them destroyed my ship, it's one person that was misguided at that particular time, but I'm not your friend. I'm not a allied to you. Yeah. So I'm willing to, to take my own life here to prove to, to end the, end your persecution of the people in the village. Yeah. And yeah. it also seems it's coming from the basis that it wasn't 
my enemies that who burned the ship, but mm. it was through the arrangement of Mariko yes. for his life that in exchange for that, mm. that ship must be scuffled yes. and, and destroyed. But Taranaga ultimately refuses the request for John Blackthorn to die. In fact, mm. intervening to stop him from stabbing himself in the stomach. Exactly. Um, and two things here. One here with John Blackthorn where he says, you know, if you're finally done, rebuild your ship. Mm -hmm. You can do that, but build me a fleet. Mm -hmm. And yes. the other side of it is that later on with Yabashigi, he, he makes the point, which we had talked about previously, that John Blackthorne provided a, a distraction. Mm -hmm. But equally, the reason why he kept him around was that on a personal note, Toranaga found him amusing. Yeah, just maybe laugh. Um, yeah. You know, it was like, <laughs> and I kind of like that, just yeah. the, the smallest of things. Yeah. You know, in some ways, John Blackthorne connected with Toranaga yeah. and he didn't quite realize it. Yeah. And also, yes, John Blackthorne was using him, like he says, but Toranaga absolutely was as well. Oh, without a doubt. And maybe yeah. they're birds of a feather to some degree. Yeah. Obviously, different levels of status Absolutely. in society but yeah. you know it was a really nice kind of realization here yeah um, i think it doesn't turn out even say do you know how many times john blackthorne avoided death because uh i, I find him funny basically yeah, exactly. you know it's almost like i wasn't going to keep him around he was useful for a time as a distraction and then when that usefulness went away I was almost going to let him die or almost going to kill him um, and then decided to keep him around a bit longer because I thought he was interesting and amusing. So uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, we will obviously talk about that, that the moment between Yabashiga and, and Taranaga in, in another Bushida point, but important uh, in this moment here, I suppose, as John has just pledged himself, uh, tried to commit seppuku to stop the people of Ajira being killed, uh, Toranaga is saying, okay, well, build me a fleet of ships and he will stop persecuting the people of the village. But he reveals later on to Yabashiga um, that he's the one that had the ship burnt. He yeah. paid someone to go put gunpowder on the ship. It was a very easy thing to do so that it would be a test for John's true loyalties as to whether John would stay and ally himself with uh, Japan effectively, which he does do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, is there anything else about John Blackthorne? I know we will talk about him again in one of the other points, but is there anything else about John Blackthorne's epilogue here? Um, I think the only other thing is sort of a brief moment towards the end mm -hmm. where John Blackthorne is trying to pull, which just seems impossible to mm -hmm. me, but I guess it is true manpower, yeah. uh, is trying to pull with a number of the villagers mm -hmm. uh, the scuffle ship into shallower water at least so that... Yeah. Um, he can salvage or, or whatever mm -hmm. uh, parts of, of the ship. And we have Buntaro arrive and effectively help him yeah. Um, yeah. to do this. And an exchange of a flask of water mm. from John to Buntaro. Buntaro looks absolutely broken here. And there's no, yeah. there's no exchange of words between the two. It is just, this is what you're doing. Bontara comes and joins. In fact, I think <laughs> I think the, the poor villagers are about to get a rest for the first time in a few hours. Um, and when Bontara joins, they all uh, join back in again. It's it's I suppose it's almost a ceremonial uh, gesture from Bontaro yeah. to say um, I'm I will help you despite what happened. And I suppose you feel the loss similar to the loss I feel uh, for for Marico. Um, but it's interesting as we as you, you reflect on the series, Bontaro is now the last surviving member of the Toda clan. Um, they've lost pretty much everybody, including his wife and his and his father. So um, so he's. Yeah, effectively the the leader of the clan, I guess, would he be? That, that's I, probably yeah, where would he would step so, up to. Yeah. But he's lost everything around him. Yeah, and um, I, I I do feel you know we talked about this throughout the series. There's been lots of feedback about you know Bontara's feelings towards Marico. He certainly senses the loss here and feels the loss of Marico. He was pushed aside by her when he tried to reconnect with her and didn't have any contact with her from that point onwards. And now she's gone. Now she's dead. So yeah. uh, no future um, relationship. And as you say, it's yeah. almost a, it's a gesture mm. of common ground in their shared grief, yeah. but also maybe drawing a line in the sand uh, yeah. but of their previous antagonism exactly. uh, towards one exactly. another. 
but wow, you do want uh, you do want Pantero on your uh, <laughs> yeah on your... one additional uh, <laughs> person, and yeah. that ship came flying out of the yeah. water. You want him on your tug of war team, did you? Yeah, exactly. Super Pantero. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it is it is a very interesting uh, final moment, I suppose, for for Pantero. But he looks broken. He though. does yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But let us get on to Bushido number three, Fuji's epilogue, mm. um, which I found really, really satisfying, actually. I really, really, really liked it. Yeah, yeah, very touching. Um, and certainly, I mean, even just you see uh, John Blackthorne returning to his Hatamoto house uh, and Fuji is then they just sit together yeah um just a, just looking a, out on the the rain that's yeah, still yeah. falling in a zero <laughs> and I just thought that was really touching you know you know it, it's interesting it's like here's a connection again with the grief of Mariko because mm-hmm. Fuji was you know knew her was friends with her yeah. you know Mariko had effectively cajoled her and said you know it is your duty after the seppuku um of her husband yeah. and baby boy yeah um to do the duty of lord taranaga and effectively to be uh john blackthorne's consort mm-hmm. um so i kind of like this i mean but even fuji said you know i like the fact that she says but my work here is done now mm-hmm. you know I'm going to be a nun. Yeah. Um, and so... I like, you know, I like that they're able to I communicate. Like you know, we, we've yeah. mentioned a few times John uh, has tended to go towards having certain phrases for conversations, but he can understand Japanese, and he's certainly far better than he could mm-hmm. a couple of years ago when he when he arrived in Japan. I guess it's a few years, right? Um, but he's able to have a small conversation. He's able to say a few specific words, you know, that that moment when the two of them sit down in the rain in the, in the garden and the, both of them look out and he says kind of no translator as, uh, as Mariko's gone, but they're able to have a connection between the two of them. They're able to have this moment of discussion, I suppose. And it, it's interesting that John pushes back when he hears that she's going off to become a nun. Yeah. Um, he gets the two words, nun, tomorrow, <laughs> out of what uh, what Fuji has said, and then says, no, I forbid you, you must yeah, uh, well, continue he says, to I, be my, uh, my consort. He says, yeah. I wish you to stay, mm. and then I order it. Yes. And Fuji just comes back and says, no, my work for Lord Taranaga mm-hmm. is complete. It is. Yeah. It's both transactional Hmm. but also that they have become friends to some degree through this experience through the loss of mariko Mm -hmm. and ultimately then that gets deepened with the gesture that john blackthorn does um with with her uh, as they row out onto the the sea hmm. to effectively almost give a, a, a naval burial yeah. to spread the ashes at sea as as john blackthorn would be used to from being in the navy yeah um, and yeah. and i thought it was really really touching actually and yeah. i i found this a, a significant emotional beat within um this show yeah um, without a doubt. you know when you look back at the previous episodes with of their relationship and yeah. um, that they have been on a journey themselves mm-hmm. yeah yeah and letting letting them go and letting them be together uh in the afterlife letting them live forever effectively and i love the kind of turn back from fuji when john's about to throw the rosary beads that he that he has uh, still gripping on to from mariko uh, he's about to throw them into the into the sea and fuji repeating mariko's words to her when uh, when her son was about to be uh, to be killed for f- uh, at the beginning of the season she repeats mariko's words which are let your hand be the last hands to hold them before uh, they're committed to death so um so it, it, it's just calling right the way back yeah. to how their relationship started effectively and here they are as you say, as friends here uh, at the end, that John is giving her a moment to say goodbye to her family yeah. as she realizes how much this means to John to say final goodbye to Mariko. Like it's a very small, but it's mm. it's a really nice story thread through this it series. Yeah. You know, it yeah. really is. Yeah, yeah. And Fuji's a fantastic character. She, she's had so many interesting moments yeah. throughout the series, going from being really aggressively against this idea of being anywhere near the barbarian to now truly being friends with him uh, yeah. here yeah and and her own grief with her husband and mm-hmm. son you yeah. know yeah. so yeah really good 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think let's move on to, uh, I suppose, the biggest Bushido point uh, from the episode, Bushido point four, which is Yabushiga and Toranaga's epilogue yeah. for the episode. Ooh, what an interesting way to do this. Um, we, we had the reaction from Yabushiga in Osaka, and now he's arrived back at what he believed, I guess, is a village in his home territories. And the minute he steps off and arrives into uh, the village, he's taken... Um, as he's, prisoner, he's arrested effectively yeah, but, and, and brought to Taranaga. But another callback right the way back to episode one, because this is exactly what happened to John Blackthorne yeah. when he arrived on uh, on these shores. Um, he is made kneel in front of Taranaga, just like uh, John Blackthorne was made kneel in front of, of Omi. Uh, Omi is standing behind um, Taranaga uh, at this stage as Taranaga is effectively interrogating Yabashika, telling him. We know everything that you've done. Yeah, you. He his spies saw um, Yabushige letting in intruders into his palace in Osaka, mm-hmm. um, and you know I think it it's really interesting um, because effectively he's stripped of his lands, they're forfeited, yeah, and is basically told he must sum- commit seppuku by sunset the following day. Mm-hmm. Um, Get your affairs in order, basically, and then you have to commit seppuku. Um, there is just a, a, an amazing line as well, where, yes, he's stripped of his lands, but he calls out asking for Omi to be given those lands. They should be passed on to him. He's his nephew. He's the one that deserves to become the next lord of Izu and, and uh, take over his place. And Taranaga responds with, no, your second death is that you don't get to do that. You don't get to name your successor. You will die and your lands are no longer yours or your family's. So yeah. um, that was really, yeah, really Yeah, he, he big. says that. He also says, that's a fair ask. You know, mm-hmm. I almost would do the same thing yeah. because I think Taranaga sees the potential in Omi yes. as well. And yeah. um, in the same way that Yabashige does as well. But yes, it's a it's a double blow here yeah. uh, to Yabashige and unfortunately to Omi as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's another blow for him. But ultimately here Yabashige asks for Taranaga to be his second mm. uh for the the seppuku. Yes. Yeah. Did you think he was going to get out of it, John? I kind of did to some extent. <laughs> For everything that we've seen this season, yeah. you think there's going to be a moment. And even that conversation that Taranaga and uh, Yabushiga have, it feels like there's moments where Taranaga's going to say, look, I understand, you know, I played you. You know, well, he knew exactly what yeah. Yabushiga was going to do. Not not play by play, but all the way back to like episode eight, episode seven, he was talking to Mariko about what Yabashiga and John Blackthorne were going to do. He knew exactly the kind of p- positions they would put themselves in yeah. as his plan played out. And here, Yabashiga has, is effectively, his usefulness is finished, but he's also been very traitorous towards Toranaga. Absolutely. And that, that can't stand and for And it's Taranaga. the opposite ends of Yabashige and John Blackthorne, because mm-hmm. John Blackthorne is reprieved by Toranaga yeah. because... He didn't let intruders in, but mm-hmm. also then proved his loyalty. Exactly. Yabashige has never proven that, and yeah. hence the seppuku. Yeah. I do really like the the little um, beforehand bit but with Yabashige and Omi where he says, you know, you're the son I never had. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. And, you know, I uh, otherwise I wouldn't have suggested that you take the lands. It's just a really nice touch, as he says, you know, the family name is in good hands, he says to Omi, and um, hands his death poem to Omi, yeah. and then a little, nice little touch to the hands his final will uh-huh. to his um, ever loyal aide yes. that has been there as well, you know? I don't who know. says, have a good death. Yeah, I, I don't know about his response to that. It's, it feels like um, maybe it's just because they've been going round and round on that for quite a long time where it's, I need to write a new will. Uh, you know, it's always, <laughs> it has always been Yabushiga's um, claim when he feels like he's in danger. Today's the day I'm going to die kind of thing. Uh, so when he hands over his final will uh, to the aide and the aide goes, well, have a good death. You know, it's almost like we've done this so many times. Um, maybe you'll get out of it. Maybe you won't. Or is he just going, well, it had to come sometime. <laughs> We've been dealing with it for such a long time here. Yeah. Have a good death. I hope it lives up to your expectations. You know, we we know from that first episode and that, that incredible introduction to the character of Yabashiga that he has always written down how his enemies have died and what their reactions are to death. And here he is at 
I suppose the cliff edge for him, his moment, yeah, uh, to to where he's going to die, and, and um, yeah. But like you say, I mean, Yabashige and Taranaga have their final words, Ooh, and yes. it's really good. And this is really where Yabashige is wanting to know well, what is to come here mm-hmm. from the events that you've set in motion yes. here. Yeah. Um, he wants to know that plan before um, he dies. And I love the when he says to Taranaga, how does it feel to control the winds? You know, this, mm. this suggestion of being very powerful yes. in terms of tactical and strategic mm-hmm. sort of play by Taranaga, which he absolutely is. And But his reply is that, well, I don't, but I study it to maximize his genius effectively yeah. here in this moment. And, you know, saying, as we said before, Mariko being the crucible of the events here, he says, I sent a woman where an army could never go. Yeah. You yeah. know, that was the Trojan horse. You know, mm-hmm. we, there were some great theories about whether it was his half-brother yeah. who was on the council, but ultimately um, it was Mariko mm-hmm. here, you know? And I, I just thought it was a really... It was just a really kind of great final conversation between the two. You know, Taranaga absolutely would not change his mind here, mm-hmm. even though possibly you th- think he could do. Yeah. But you could sense the history between these two. Definitely. Um, yeah. And it, it was really, really good. It but felt it's like a, yeah. a good, it felt like a meaningful send off for Yabashige. It did. And he's the only one that hears the final plan. Um, you know, it's something that throughout the series, um, as viewers, you've wanted to get into the mind of Toranaga. What is it that his moves are going to lead to? What is it that, that he's actually planning towards? And what he's planning towards is, um, and we see it, um, you know, on screen. It's not like they're avoiding showing massive battles or massive scenes with huge amounts of extras. It's there. In this future discussion to Yabashiga, Toranaga tells him the whole plan will play out in about a month's time after the mourning period for uh, for Mariko, basically, which uh, Oshido agreed to um, at the start of the episode. After that mourning period, their armies will face off against each other. And we see it. We see huge swaths of troops massive armies yeah. standing ready to do battle but at the point of doing battle lady ashiba will call back her troops or let's say the heirs troops she will send a letter to ashido calling back those troops saying uh they, he no longer has their support and ashido will be left on his own with no war no battle no support and that will be the end of his time reigning uh, yeah, and but, Taranaga will well, take and over it's interesting control. because yeah. we do have um, a, a scene prior to this of Lady Shizu giving Taranaga a letter sent in secret by Lady Achiba mm. um, and he recounts um, part of a poem that Mariko had said to him uh, previously mm. and we, we, we have this conversation of we only have Mariko's words now and I love that he then says, what a bonfire she made. Yeah. It was this crucible. And he repeats that. You know, as I say, the crucible is a fitting metaphor of what Mariko was, uh, uh, what she made within that bonfire, that fire. And, and yeah, you see that prediction of Ashiba withholding the heir's troops from Ashido's side in the battle of the five armies effectively yeah. that they're, yeah. they're talking about here yeah and um, so really good and part of this then is that Tonaga doesn't tell yabashige this but yabashige immediately says you know he understands the secret heart mm. of Toranaga that it is to reinstate the shogunate yeah um, you know yeah and be the shogun that he um, will be the leader he does yeah. actually want the power even though he's always claimed he never wanted the power yeah um but his plan will lead to a new era of peace is the way that he's describing yeah. it um yeah it's it's just a it's just a really interesting choice to do it this way and you have yabashige saying you know well it's all hypocrisy you know lesser men dying pointless hmm. um and Toranaga saying except if i win 
um, then because Taranaga says all these other people have contributed. In fact, in a sense, you know, maybe he's the the master puppeteer, but mm. he acknowledges and gives credit to the people in effect that he has puppeteered. Yeah, they've played their part. They are as of equal importance mm-hmm. to him in setting the events that transpire for this overall strategy. Yeah. He says, except if I win, again, reflecting on what um, John Blackthorne said when the he arrived. The first time they met, yeah. 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 He says, you know, this won't be pointless mm-hmm. if I win. Yeah. And that's the same philosophy as Taranaka. And exactly. maybe that's where the connection truly came. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I really like that. And of course, we have then uh, the sepulchre. Yeah, the death of On the cliff, looking over the the ocean. Yes, and Taranaga does take his head. I I just felt like there was going to be a moment where Taranaga was going to stay his hand. But, you know, there there is that reaction from where he says, you know, why tell a dead man the future as as he commits seppuku? Um, Again, interesting choice. I want to hear our, our listeners' thoughts on the final episode and, and how this played out. You know, it's it's a, an interesting way to tell the story, as I said, but I wonder why they chose to do it this way, where it's Taranaga telling Yabashiga the future and us as the audience not seeing that that's how it actually plays out. You know, he's giving a glimpse to the future to a man that's dying here, um, but he doesn't, we don't see that that's exactly how it turns out. And as I say, there's yeah. no place at the end of the episode telling you this is how it played out. In fact, all we have is that moment with Bontara helping John Blackthorne to to raise one ship from the ocean and Toranaga staring out over what you suspect is the future. He's ter- staring out over Japan, knowing this is the first step in his plan that will get him um, to win the war effectively. Yeah. So, um, But also, as we say, knowing that this is going to be a bloodless battle that's coming up that's why you're pretty certain that we're not going to get a second season it's not like they're going to go and tell the story of that actual battle and have yeah. big no i wouldn't have big massive so. moments of the five armies staging uh a standoff it's not it's not going to happen so they they but show it in that this battle that actually moment. happened in history in real life yes. you know well um, again battle is is the wrong term for it it's a, it's a standoff that that led to um the real life uh character taking over japan so uh, so this is this is similar to what happened and in fact we're going to actually incorporate that into our Bushido 5 um what happened to the actual characters in history because i you know i think it's in i think it's really interesting that these were real people of course dramatized for uh the show uh it's kind of interesting when you know you watch um biographical mu- movies and they tend to avoid the fact that most biographical movies or biographies are historical fiction they're not really what happened there are lots of amalgamations and, yeah. and lots of things here shogun is actually very specific telling you we've changed all the names these are the real people. This is not exactly what happened to them. But there are some connections, some things that did uh, happen in history. So uh, first up, just to, to mention kind of the three major characters, let's talk about them. Hosokawa Gracia was the character that Mariko was based on. And interestingly, elements of Mariko's story follow uh, Gracia's quite closely. Um, yeah. But her manner of death is slightly different. Um, when Ashida attempted to take Gracia hostage, like Ashido tried to do here in, in uh, taking hostage in Mariko, um, she was actually killed by the family retainer. So uh, the family retainer would be like the guard, um, the, the, yeah, the bodyguard right. of the yeah. family. Um, he killed her, then committed seppuku himself, and then set the mansion on fire. And the outrage over her death was so big that it forced Ishido to abandon his planned uh, his planned war. So very similar here to what happened to Mariko in the story of Shogun. Yeah, it's, it, it's really interesting. Mm. Um, you know, that it's similar kind of thing. It was like, I guess, the weight of public opinion. Really, exactly. Ultimately, exactly. Uh, forced the Shida to abandon his plans. Yeah. Um, so absolutely really, really interesting. Yeah. And then William Adams, who, uh, John Blackthorne is based on, um, eventually he was given permission to return home to England. Uh, he ultimately, did, ultimately decided to stay in Japan, uh, became highly involved in Japan's Red Seal trade and uh, chartered and served as captain on many expeditions uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, He married a Japanese woman named Ayuki and had a son, Joseph, and a daughter, Susanna. He died in Japan at the age of 55. So interestingly, when we were talking at at the opening, uh, John was saying that that it looked like John Blackthorne was back in England with his grandchildren. Um, 
but and looks a lot older than 55. Maybe 55 in the 1600s looked like 80. I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but John Blackthorne did make it to 55. And then finally, uh, Tokugawa Isu, who's, uh, who's the character that Lord uh, Toranaga is based on, he received appointment as Shogun in 1603, which would be around the right time. The show started yeah. in 1600, so three years later. That would be around right for the timeline for how long John Blackthorne has spent here. He voluntarily abdicated from office in 1605, but remained in power until his death in 1616 and set up a careful set of rules, which is called the Pukahan system, designed to keep the daimo and samurai in check under the new shogunate. So it's interesting. He set up a whole new structure to ensure what happened with Ashida didn't happen again um, after getting into yeah. power. So that era of peace that, that Toranaga speaks to uh, Yabashiga about does come to pass uh, under absolutely in the real term in real life yeah i mean what's fascinating is you know it feels like you know whether say like in in england the 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 power between monarch and parliament mm-hmm. and leading to the civil war again it's you know it's the structures of power in japan and how they evolved into i guess the modern structures mm. and it'd be interesting to understand how i mean I, I i don't know but just how you know those those modern structures of japanese governance what's the evolution there from that point you know well interestingly that's what james clavell's novels uh, after shogun are about because they lead all the way up into the 1900s so uh, apparently so each of the each of the books takes not a, not specifically a century but it will take a big story from the history leading up to yeah. uh, to the 20th century so uh, so i think that's that's maybe something that you could uh, could jump into john yeah Sounds good. That could be interesting. Yeah. Uh, any other notes? Any other moments that we've missed from the episode that you want to have? Uh, no, nothing from me, really. Yeah. Um, yourself, Derek? Just, just one, and I think it's because you mentioned that that letter that came from Lady Ashiba to uh, Toranaga. There is that moment with Ashiba sitting with her son, um, the heir to to the throne of Japan, effectively, where the two of them are talking about the poetry that Mariko wrote, um, and they're talking about. You know its power and and its effectiveness that it has on uh, on Ashiba. I think it's so central to that coming together of Toranaga and Ashiba, uh, which we don't really see on screen. We just see that letter that she yeah. hands over. But you would presume her thinking back on her relationship with Mariko, the power of of the words that Mariko left her with about um, there are no flowers unless they fall. You know that was the initial uh, initial words that she. Uh, had with her when the two of them had their last conversation. So um, just that moment, I felt it was really powerful in the episode, yeah. um, showing that Ashiba is turning away from what Ashido yeah. wanted. Um, just, I, I thought it was a really good moment just to have the mother and son together, uh, her, him helping her out with the poem, you yeah. know, as a, as a fun little game between the two of them, but it having so much more impact uh, on the world of Japan uh, in the letter she writes to Toranaga, which I presume included the final version of that poem, like I would guess. Maybe, yeah. Uh, which is what inspired uh, the words Toranaga says on the other end when he gets it from his, yeah. uh, from his consort. Excellent yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's a really good moment. So Derek, uh, overall, what do you think of chapter 10? What a series. <laughs> what an, uh, an amazing show. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I absolutely wasn't expecting this to be an epilogue and epilogue only episode. I think we've yeah. we've talked about that earlier on. I'm really interested to hear um, what our fellow warriors thought of uh, thought of the show. But it makes total sense to me. I think um, they've they haven't put a foot wrong for me about bringing this story to life on screen it's been so interesting to watch every week we had actually kind of hit upon it much earlier than we thought we had uh, in about episode six or so we were talking about Taranaga will do everything he possibly can to avoid war and that is his plan and that will get to his plan and, and the fact that they did call out you know hey everybody in the back if you didn't catch this last week was Crimson Sky that was Mariko she was always the plan um, she did exactly what she was supposed to do so that we didn't have a war so it wouldn't be army versus army millions of people dying or th- hundreds of thousands of people dying that was Crimson Sky here we are at the end and the fruits of what she delivered for us will bring a better Japan and a, and a, a greater era of peace uh, I thought that's a fascinating story to tell yeah absolutely um, so interesting and, and so well put together the acting has been fantastic the characters have been so interesting to watch uh, every week so I'm going to miss Shogun but I'm happy to have had this type of story 
being told on screen for the first time in what feels like a very long time. You know? Absolutely. It feels like something like this when successful, they try and spin it out into a second season or they already have a second season ready to go. Whereas this feels like it's taken four or five years to get to the screen. We know that there was a lot of work done uh, and you can see the fruits that uh, really, really good. Uh, how about yourself, John? What do you think of the final episode and the series of Shogun overall? I th- really enjoyed the epilogue. Um, I would give it four sea view seppuku's out of five. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I, I just like how it ties it up, really. I mean, it was a bit of a jolt. I was expecting the episode to be a bit more kinetic mm-hmm. moving forward. It, it felt more like a gentle roll down a slope mm-hmm. uh, towards the end. Um, I think it was just because it was so heightened by chapter nine. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, on reflection, I just liked seeing these relationships because in effect that's what it's being about yeah. is these relationships come to a conclusion mm-hmm. and how they impacted the future and the prediction that is laid out by the conversation and the chat between Yabashige and Toranaga mm-hmm. before Yabashige gets um performs seppuku so i i really kind of enjoyed that um and i like all these moments through here um, and with the overarching shadow of mariko's death here and i I mean for me i think taranaga saying what a bonfire she made is such a great line yeah and all these different touch points to various things that have happened in the previous episodes and i think totally agree with you you know this whole series just absolutely was uh, an exploration and investigation around soft power in yeah. a sense yeah. um within the confines of the rules of yeah. of japan in this period and i just thought it was really good with the the disruptive element of you know western influence there whether mm-hmm. it is the catholic church or the arrival of john blackthorne so yeah. i absolutely love this series um and i'm actually really pleased it's just going to be this series i yeah. didn't see the need to then follow it on with a, a season two and yeah. um, i just think it's so interesting that you saw the saber rattling you saw the the people that are willing to go to war over anything you saw you know the younger characters who tried to instantly react to things that a lot of them dying uh, in this season you know including uh, Toranaga's son you know people that are react instantly to things the success here the person that wins out through everything is the thoughtful one that sits back and avoids those confrontations as much as possible he's the one that stepped out of it and will lead to the betterment of Japan yeah um it's it makes it such a different story from all of the other action Absolutely. movies you've seen where it's like our army versus your army, whoever has the bigger weapons wins, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and that's what you think is going to happen right at the start. You think John Blackthorne's here with his Western, um, his Western abilities, his ships, his weapons, and he's going to hand them over to Taranaga and Taranaga will, uh, will storm the castle of Osaka. Uh, it's a completely different story to that. Um, yeah. And I think a very successful one. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, really, definitely. really good. Yeah. I think with that, let us get on to our feedback from our fellow warriors. Absolutely. Um, Up to yeah. episode nine. Um, we're, we are recording this in advance of episode 10, but we do want to hear your thoughts about episode 10. So uh, please keep sending them in to us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. We also have all of our episodes now available on YouTube and we're getting lots of people uh, commenting over there as well. But of course, Chapter 9 was a massively affecting episode, so lots of people uh, contacting us after that episode. Yes. First up, an email from Gail Fraser, who says, Great show. I love it. I read the book many, many years ago when I was quite a bit younger. I'm 73 now. I just finished the book again. Love, love, love the show. Love the book so much as well. My husband of 40 years isn't a reader, but he loves the show as well. I'm reading the whole Asian saga now. I've finished Shogun now and started on Taipan. Anyway, thank you, everyone, for filling our time so momentously, Gail. Well, thanks, Gail. Thanks, Gail. Yeah, great stuff. Um, I'd say, yes, I think there's four books in the a- Asian saga. I mm. think three or four um, by James. I thought it was four or five, but yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. it's four or five, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, th- I think that maybe the last one is set very much in the modern era. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I guess it just feels a little bit distant from yeah. this uh, shogun. Um, but... Yes, uh, so glad you liked the show uh, and enjoyed 
uh, your reread of of the book as well. Absolutely. And I suppose that's always the great thing about having an adaptation. Some people just will not sit down and read a book. So if the adaptation is there, similar to ourselves, we haven't read the book. Honestly, I do have it. I'm gonna, I'm definitely going to be reading it uh, over the summer. But uh, the adaptation is there. I'll watch the adaptation. <laughs> it's, it's much easier to yeah. uh, to find time for that sometimes. Uh, so uh, so I'm happy that your husband was able to, to enjoy the show as well. Great stuff. Thanks, Gail. Uh, we also got an email in from Sandra who said, Hi, Derek and John. I've been enjoying your podcast on Shogun. Uh, to be honest, I was getting more and more nervous from when Bontara returned from the dead, upset in the relationship between Mariko and Anjin. I could not see how Tar- Taranaga was going to make things come right again, especially after losing ally after ally. But then came episode 8. We saw Taranaga's hand pulling the strings or guiding his birds of prey, especially when he revealed his secret heart to Mariko about how he really felt about what had happened and about what he wanted her to do. It reminded me of the hot springs when Anjum was describing a night in London taking a play, a tragedy, doomed lovers and cursed kings. Anjum and Mariko are those doomed lovers, but who is the cursed king? Ashiba's father, Mariko's father, Ishido or Taranaga himself? Anyway, it all seemed terribly Shakespearean, which calmed my mind over what would happen next. It will all come together, tragedy, comedy or a little of both. Let's hope that Taranaga is more like Prospero, whose magic stirs things up, but ultimately quells all tempests and arguments, rather than King Lear or Hamlet, whose actions end in death. The plot feels so all-encompassing and epic, a real masterpiece, Shakespearean. Will Anjan ever know what Taranaga's plans were? Will he understand what Mariko was trying to accomplish? Will Yabashige have to face up to what his wheeling dealing has done? Will Anjan stay in Japan, or will Taranaga let him go? Remember the priest in the prison in episode 2? He said something along the line of, if Taranaga has made you his ally, you will never leave Japan alive. I think the real samurai William Adams never did return to England. He remained in Japan for the rest of his life. In episode 9, Mariko put her life on the line three times, once when she tried to walk out with Lady Kiri and Lady Shizu, second when she tried to commit seppuku, and third when she put herself between the door and the blast when they were trapped. Third time lucky or not so lucky. But how will Anjan react? He will be heartbroken, especially after he begged her to live, if not for good sense or for God, then to live for him. Yeah, great, great line that was. Absolutely. I'm very grateful that the show's creators gave us some last moments between Mariko and Anjan when he stepped up to be her second, saying he's been through hell already that moment before the seppuku, when she held his hand in the same way that Father Martin had held her hand when he gave her the rosary to hold on to when there was nothing else. When Anjan helped Mariko up, after the attempt at Sopaku, holding her hand until she grasped it, and when Anjan went to her room, the opposite from when Mariko slipped into his room in episode 4 and they had one last night together. Will the people held hostage now be let go? Will Taranaga and Ashido face off against each other on the battlefield? Will we see the battle? What will Ishiba do? What will happen to Ishido? Back in episode 2, I thought there was an undercurrent between Ishiba and Taranaga, perhaps a romance which ended when she became a consort of the Taiko? Was this part of her hatred for Taranaga, a jilted lover as well as thinking he was the mastermind behind the murder of her father? Could Ashiba become his next consort? Is the heir really Taranaga's son rather than the Taiko's? Will Taranaga become Shogun, even after he protested it so much? Publicly he says he doesn't want to, but perhaps in his secret heart he knows he must, because how could anyone else be trusted with such power? It's a lot to squeeze into the final episode, but after that jam-packed episode 9, I think they could do it. I can't wait. Thank you for all your in-depth discussions about each episode. It really helped me to think through the implications of what was going on each time, and I cannot wait to see what these actors do next. Sandra Nokata. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sandra. Absolutely. Well, certainly, I think um, you're in for uh, a nice little treat with this epilogue format um, because, in a sense, they do fit all that in. Yeah. Uh, Maybe just not in the proportions that you think uh, they're going to be in. Yes. uh, For sure. And interestingly, I think your point from episode two, I ought there was that those looks between Achiba and Taranaga, mm-hmm. which I wondered what that was about. And yeah. I have a feeling it was because of the murder of her father. Mm. I think it was probably more to do with that. But you just never know. You I know, do there remember, is a yeah. lot unsaid here. Yeah. Um I do remember suspecting that the that the heir was not the um was not the son of the Taika, that it was potentially the son of uh, of Toronaga, I think. Be, I think partly because of the time, there were mentions that the Tycho couldn't conceive a son. This was like his, I don't know, hundredth attempt or twentieth attempt or something. Nobody else was able to give him a son. So why 
was uh, Ushiba able to give him a son? And then yeah. you're kind of thinking, well, maybe it's not his son. Maybe it's because it's Taranaga. So, um, yeah, so I, 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 I certainly suspected that back at the time, but I think it's something they didn't want to dwell on. Again, it's historical fiction based on a living person. So maybe uh, James Clavell, when he was writing the novel, didn't want to put a real fine point on it, that this is uh, this was not yeah. the actual heir to, to the throne. It's actually somebody else's son, maybe. Um, but it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Thank you, Sandra, for uh, the feedback. So uh, pleased you've been enjoying the, the series as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the finale as well. So email that into us. Over on YouTube, on our Chapter 9 discussion, uh, I got a message in from SFIN13 who says, Why did the feedback you read last week say Richard Chamberlain is dead? I can't find any articles that say he's passed. Um, I just did I did check this out immediately after I got the message in from uh, from SFIN. Thanks so much for sending us the message. Uh, Richard Chamberlain hasn't passed away. Um, the message that we got in from Marta last week, um, I think she may have just confused that um, he passed the age of 90 in March. She may have seen that, um, but what that actually meant was he turned 90 on March 31st. So, uh, yes, um, okay. so I can see that. Yeah, Richard Chamberlain uh, is very much alive. Very much alive. I'm celebrating his 90th birthday just a couple of weeks ago. So um, that's that's really good and, and I'm glad uh, he's not passed away. So I'm really sorry that we actually yeah. uh, said that. My, my sincere apologies for not checking uh, on that. I think we just we, we just read it and, and continued on. Um, but Esfin did respond uh, saying, I remembered uh, looking up Richard Chamberlain when the series started, so it was fresh in my mind that he was alive. Thankfully, he still is. I listened to you guys through Apple Podcasts, and it's the second show I'm following with you. The other is The Boys and Gen V. Keep up the good work. Excellent stuff. Thank you, uh, Esfin13, uh, mm-hmm. for that and for uh, sort of correcting us on Richard yeah. Chamberlain. Yeah, so sorry about that for all those listening and mm-hmm. who thought that maybe Richard Chamberlain had passed away. He is alive and kicking. He is. Um, also on YouTube, at Lamir Gnalag8310 says, would you take suggestions of some possible spin-off miniseries you might like to watch, such as <laughs> Shogun the Bushido Code, mm. Shogun the Willow World of Edo, <laughs> Shogun Battles of the Faiths, Catholics versus Protestants versus Buddhists, Shogun Tales of Wajiro's Stone Garden, Shogun Seppuku of a Warrior, the permanent solution to a temporary problem, <laughs> Shogun Yabashigi's Book of Death. Hashtag katanas and kimonos rock. Like it. Thank you so much for those <laughs> spin off uh, suggestions. Really, really good. Now, if you're an executive at Hulu or FX, you may be considering uh, a spin off because the show has been massively popular. Yeah, um, absolutely. What do you think? What's your What's your favorite in there, John? I think I think the Seppuku of a Warrior, the permanent, the permanent solution to a temporary problem. <laughs> yes, I quite like as well the Willow World of Edo mm-hmm. to see the battle between courtesans and the church. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> That'd be, be great. great. Just throwing bottles back and forth across the street <laughs> at each other or something. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Thanks Good so stuff. much. Thanks for the feedback. Also over on YouTube, uh, David K. 6269 says, This was an amazing episode. I saw Lady Marico finally break down at the end of the Battle of the Gate when her spear attacks were all being parried and trapped by a multitude of enemy spears, but with the spearmen clearly not striking to kill her, she realises finally that she can't obtain death in battle, which she was hoping to obtain, uh, yes. but must instead go through the mental and spiritual agony of having to kill herself, and I think that is what makes her finally break down. You're partially correct about the ritual itself. The official Shogun podcast explained that for female ritual suicides, there may May not have been a second, or if there is, that the second is really there for moral support and does not strike and behead the person as they do for male ritual suicides. The reason is that females would position a knife low, aiming up to, at their heart, and then she will fall forward onto the ba- blade, impaling herself, hopefully in the heart, allowing her to die quickly. I think the podcast stated that if they do not fall in the way that, that impales their heart, the woman will use a small knife, I assume a second blade, that they have ready for this purpose, to cut her own throat and bleed out if the blow to the heart is not successful. For men, they will not seek to impale themselves in the heart, but are supposed to cut from across their abdomens, which is extraordinarily painful, but not immediately fatal. People can linger for days before dying. Some males have seconds, which will prevent such long suffering by decapitating them after the victim makes the required disemboweling cuts. 
Very good. Yes, the official podcast there, bringing lots of the details. Absolutely. Yeah. I know, I know we've, we've mentioned this before, but we are recording the episodes in advance uh, of them being released. Uh, we actually released the podcast about an hour after the episodes come out, just purely because we want to give people a chance to listen to them. But we don't listen to the official podcast in advance of recording our podcast. So, uh, so there are details that are there, of course, by the makers. They're steeped in this for years and years. So they have much more knowledge about, yeah. uh, about the detail behind it. But it is interesting. It that, is. It's uh, really interesting. Interesting. So thanks, uh, David K, for the sending on those uh, snippets of information. It's uh, yeah, really good. Finally, from YouTube at Joey Art K added, hostage taking was a common accepted practice back then. There would be no need to hide it. That part doesn't make sense. Mm. Being a devout Catholic, Mariko would not have attempted seppuku. Having someone kill you under your direction is still suicide. God isn't stupid. Of course, adultery is a sin too, so this is really a slanderous portrayal of the character. By the way, women didn't do seppuku. They slit their neck arteries. What is abuse now was not what was considered abuse in the 1600. Pantaro just comes back from fighting for survival for 20 days and finds his wife living with a foreign man. But later, Toronaga gets 49 days to mourn his son. Then he sees chemistry between them and she probably refused his advances later. She got off easy, to be honest. That whole scene is ridiculous. First off, Buntaro would have killed Blackthorn immediately, regardless of what Taranaga might say. Second, Taranaga would have never even considered insulting Buntaro or Mariko so badly by having a woman of her class living with a man, let alone a foreigner. That simply was not done. Plus, love had nothing to do with marriage at the class level most of the time. They were arranged marriages, and her duty was to please her husband, (coughs) not look down on him despite him saving her life. And they had other Japanese that could speak Portuguese. Why disgrace your best warrior by using her? She only has high status because she is Buntaro's wife. Mm. She has no other position or title other than the daughter of a traitor that should be executed. And a Christian convert on top of it that a few years later would have been a death sentence. Fiction is one thing, but ridiculous fantasy is another. Oh, um, strong words, uh, Joey oh, yeah. R.K., um, for sure. Really interesting opinion. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure it's ridiculous fantasy. I think that, you know, it's probably hugely complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, in a sense, Toronaga asked Mariko to be his interpreter. I think mm-hmm. there was a wider plan for Mariko on the basis of what happened to her father. So I don't think, um, necessarily Toronaga expected there to be a relationship that yeah. developed there uh, and and indeed you know he says to Buntaro well she is your wife you can do what you want mm-hmm. um you know there is that conversation yeah. uh, so I, I think it's a difficult one to have and I I think I mean this is the problem you come at it from this period of time with yeah. your thoughts and yeah. you know in a sense you know you are right what abuse is now not necessarily considered abuse now yeah. yes hostage taking was common practice <laughs> but equally so then I, I do want to do want to just say it's still abuse whether it was considered abuse at the time or not no, we exactly. consider it abuse now okay. but it was still abuse by Bontaro. um so joey I, I understand that you come to come at this with your opinion it's pretty clear that your opinion is very different from our opinion uh, about the show and about the characterizations that we see here yeah um so while you may have the opinion that women were downtrodden and were only there to please their husbands, I would doubt that every single woman felt the same in the 1600s. They may have felt trapped in the situation and may have outwardly portrayed that they were there just to support their husbands. I think that's dealt with quite clearly in the show in the Eightfold Fence where Mariko says she just absolutely will give Buntaro nothing. That is how she will live out her life being stuck in this marriage with someone that doesn't love her and she doesn't love she will just give him nothing so um so while your opinion of course is your opinion you're, you're it's it's always interesting to hear someone else's thoughts about it um whether a devout catholic will al- always follow the teachings of the church i think we know from history that is uh, that's not a, 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 well, that's bi- a binding way just because you're a catholic you will you will follow the catholic uh, teachings at all times mariko trying her best to follow the teachings knowing that seppuku which is part of japanese culture at the time would be considered suicide so uh, she is 
trying to manage that. Well, I think yeah. it's interesting as well because, you know, we have Mariko in her conversation with Taranaga say, I am both effectively mm -hmm. in the Catholic faith yeah. and I am also a member of this clan. Why Absolutely. the clan and 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 also Japanese. And Japanese. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think it's to that point which, you know, I don't think anyone is a solitary position in life or identity, whatever mm -hmm. it is. They, they have different aspects here. Uh, and that's how she, um, in a sense, tells Taranaga that you can trust me. I won't do things to further the Catholic Church. And you're right. You know, very much after this period, Christians were, were persecuted. Mm. Um, but at this moment, you know, it is a difficult relationship that happens here. You have, uh, you know, it, it, it's to that geopolitical element, I think, uh, with the, the church effectively fronting for the Portuguese as mm -hmm. well. Yep. So it's not just about the church. Um, Absolutely. Uh, having their own sort of, strategies as to why they're there what they're yeah. doing there and, and also certain, the yeah. japanese reciprocating that whether it's that they are amenable to that like some of the council regents yeah and um, or just think it it's strange because they're buddhists well absolutely but again you know we, we hear from a lot of these characters in this in this version of the story that they're there for the purse strings they're there for what goes into their wallet basically so um but interestingly uh hasagawa gracia who was catholic um the character that mariko is based on um and the reason why she was able to be catholic at a time when catholics would be persecuted um is because of her high station. Uh, it, it's interesting that you mentioned pretty much Ashido's opinion of Mariko, that, that she is a traitor who deserves to be killed. That's not Taranaga's opinion of her. Taranaga allied with her father. Um, the, the reason why they had the years of peace and the Taiko as leader of Japan is because um, Mariko's father killed the former leader of Japan. So, uh, so who was the Mad King, as we, as we discussed earlier on in the season, shown as the Mad King? So... Yeah. Um, it really is a perception of history. That is, that is the the way you perceive it, the way you choose to to see the story. Uh, of course, will lead to your opinion about some of these characters. But I think the story has been a, a really interesting version of that past. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you know, it, it's it's just really interesting as well that it, it generates the discussion. Mm -hmm. so, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, uh, Joey Arts. We have another bit of email feedback from Hatamoto Von Doom. Uh, Victor says, Yo, warriors, what a gut wrencher of an episode. I think Lady Mariko absolutely shines here. Mm -hmm. She went toe to toe with Ashido and stood her ground. I found the scene of the attempted departure extremely riveting, but then again, the entire episode was intense. Lady Mariko finally got what she wanted without taking her own life. Yabashige really tickles me. I didn't know samurai could tap dance. <laughs> I agree with the father visitor. War is coming. Mm. Sayonara Hashimoto Von Doom. Absolutely, Victor. Mariko is abs is essential in this episode. She's fantastic, and I'm glad that the show gave her an entire episode to show her story in there. And Yabashiga has just been standout this season. He's been absolutely fantastic right up until the end. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Yabashiga is one of my favorite characters along mm -hmm. with his nephew, Omi. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just really, really like them in, in a sense. They're fantastic. They, they feel yeah. like they're caught in the middle to mm -hmm. some extent and are just, in a sense, just trying to find the best way out. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think ultimately then with episode 10 seeing yabashige's mm. um kind of almost slight insanity a bit mm -hmm. um you know the, the regret of what happens yeah um you know it's not what he meant to happen in that sense yeah um, exactly and i'm totally with you you know this is such a great episode for mm -hmm. mariko yeah, yeah. In, in terms of both as a character and for the actor as well in terms of just the tension uh, throughout this episode. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much, Hatamoto Van Doom. Yeah, thanks, Victor. Over on Facebook, Jamie Lawson says, 
totally gripped throughout the episodes so gripped that it didn't feel like an hour had passed mm-hmm. and totally agree jamie um really really good tv here um absolutely uh gripping yeah i can't believe 10 episodes have passed i know absolutely one last comment from uh, from YouTube from Christina Berg, who says, Suicide is a sin in the Catholic faith, but not in the Protestant faith. However, nowadays, the Roman Catholic Church has lessened its stand somewhat. Yeah, Christina, I suppose um, I was brought up as Catholic, as, as we've mentioned before in the podcast, and John was brought up in the, in the Protestant faith, um, as, as we yeah. as we talked about before. So, uh, yeah, the, the opinions that uh, the Catholic Church have about suicide are, uh, um, yeah, they've, they've changed, I suppose, over time, but they were what what's the word pre draconian? What would be the what would be the word? It's like you're completely excommunicated from the church uh, after your death. So uh, so yeah, the, it's about the clashing of those two cultures is one of the central pieces of the story. The idea that John arrives in Japan not knowing anything about Japan, and within his first day there, he sees someone try to commit seppuku. So trying to understand what's different exactly, in their mind and what's exactly. different in their upbringings and, and, and their beliefs. So uh, it's very interesting. Thank, thanks so much for that, Christina. Yeah, thanks, Christina. And finally, over on Facebook, Dr. Bob Phillips says, I didn't think I could get any more intense than last week. The entire episode was perfectly paced, irresistible in momentum and shocking in the final explosive moment. Mariko pitched her performance exquisitely. Anjan Sama had the bewildered reactive response of a mariner in the middle of a tropical storm. Bishido's carefully constructed prison of politeness has collapsed. I can't believe it's only one episode to the end of the series. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Bob. I completely agree. I think mm. uh, last week's episode was really just very masterful. Just stunning. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, obviously, uh, if Anna Sawai doesn't get some kind of nomination for an award for that performance in yeah, the show, absolutely. Like, uh, people are not watching the right TV. <laughs> she was masterful. Thanks so much, Dr. Bob. And thanks, everybody, for all of your feedback. Um, I've, I've been saying throughout the series, and I think regular listeners to two podcast industries will be aware that I usually listen to a few podcasts uh, about the shows that we're covering, just to kind of get a, kind of a, a dip into what other people are covering. Uh, the official podcast for Shogun if you want more uh, information it's a really good uh, quick half hour um, interviews with the with the cast and crew definitely have a listen to that uh, I've been also listening to the Binge Town TV podcast which is an American podcast about the show and I just find it really really fun uh, three American guys uh, who I think in the first episode say we're never going to pr- pronounce any of the characters names right so we're going to make up nicknames <laughs> for them all <laughs> so that's that's been a lot of fun to listen to well it's uh, funny in my notes John Blackthorne is JB yeah. and Yabashigi is Yabs it's always yabs. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. The only way is up. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I'd also recommend for a, a, a different take, uh, Black Girl Couch Reviews is starting her coverage of the show. She's just done two episodes so far, uh, but always fun to listen to. It's, uh, it's very different from two Irish guys uh, talking about Absolutely. Shogun as well. Yeah. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us for the entirety of Shogun Season 1, or the only season. Well, absolutely. Uh, But of course, fellow warriors, you're more than welcome to join us and subscribe to us over on tvpodcastindustries.com. And of course, please uh, leave a review or share your thoughts. But of course, share the podcast because sharing the podcast is, of course, sharing sharing the love. love. And we will, as we said previously, we will... We are still around doing the Star Wars The Bad Bat. Mm-hmm. Just two episodes um, left. And we will be moving into Dead Boy Detective mm-hmm. uh, in the coming week, as yep. well as Tales of the Empire a- yep. animated uh short series coming out on May the 4th. Yeah, if you want to know what else is coming up for TV Podcast Industries this year, pop on over to tvpodcastindustries.com and there's a, a little note that I have up there of shows coming in 2024. I think the page is just tvpodcastindustries.com slash 2024. Uh, lots of stuff coming up. We've, we're returning to the boys in the middle of summer uh, of this year. We've got the last season of Umbrella Academy coming yep. up later this year. We've got the fourth season of The Witcher coming up as well. Absolutely. Uh, that just confirmed to be ending at season five. Possibly. Um, Probably um, the Acolyte as well we may cover. We need to just see how that uh, fits into our schedules for sure. But I certainly would love to um, take that on. Yeah, that would be really cool. That'd be really cool. But it's been excellent talking about Shogun. This was our our big our big swing uh, for our tenth anniversary year podcast, uh, talking about a historical fiction show which we don't normally talk about. So I hope you enjoyed listening along with us and joining us for our coverage of Shogun as much as we've enjoyed recording it. Yes, absolutely. Until next time, fellow warriors. Uh, remember, keep watching, and of course, keep listening. Bye, bye. <laughs>